Hey everybody, welcome back. And so we're going to resume with part two of the eight part series um, that I'm doing on um, what we can learn from Claire Weeks about what a lot of us experience in, um, in benzo withdrawal and bind as it relates to um, kind of our psychology in it. I, want, I don't want to just say it's our mental symptoms because even if you have primarily physical symptoms, a lot of what I'm talking about actually also applies to physical symptoms in terms of the way we react or respond to them. Just like yesterday, I want to put the caveat out there that um, you might hear some snoring in the background. Those are my dogs, including my elderly pup, Addie. So she's not snoring yet, but that could change in a moment's notice. So did want to put the warning out there and, and thank you ahead of time for being patient with me about that. But um, that's the life of being in benzo withdrawal with our animals, right? They don't leave our side and so we can't leave theirs either. Um, so anyway, I, I talked uh, the other day, I guess it was yesterday when I posted um, about uh, again, this this kind of trajectory that Claire Weeks would spell out. And it was, it was how she began to understand people that had profound experiences of nervous suffering. And these were people that had mental, emotional, and physical symptoms of anxiety, okay? So that could be anything from major heart palpitations to agoraphobia, um, to being afraid to be alone, to intrusive thoughts, to... Um, generalized kind of anxiety, just a, a sense of dis-ease um, to depersonalization and derealization. And she didn't use all the same terms that we use now. I remember, she was writing, you know, decades and decades ago, um, but she was onto something. And again, where I think it's applicable to us is that even if we weren't put on uh, a benzodiazepine for an anxiety issue, um, I don't know many people that are going through um, a complicated withdrawal experience where where this these things that she's talking about aren't relevant on some level. And like I said, even if you're not having intrusive thoughts or a tremendous amount of fear or terror, those types of things, um, even with our physical symptoms, we can get very anxious about those. So just to recap a little bit, remember the three things she talks about that kind of keep us locked in developing that groove in our record of, of, you know, kind of doom and gloom and anxiety and things getting more and more stuck, okay? And she talks about uh, sensitization, uh, which absolutely applies to us um, and all the different ways that our body, once sensitized, can show up. Again, whether that's mo mentally, emotionally, or whether that's physically, whether that's, you know, gastric problems, cardio problems, respiratory problems, skin issues, um, hypersensitivity to things, all kinds of um, uh, physical manifestations of this. And then, of course, all of the litany of mental and emotional kind of anguish we go through. So the sensitization of our nervous system is basically that exaggerated response that we have to everything. And again, I'll go back to that same idea of the tin can. I love that metaphor because that makes sense. So, for example, you know, I'm I talk a lot about the fact that while I'm in withdrawal, while I'm tapering and I'm in withdrawal, I'm also in perimenopause. Um, and it is its own unique brand of hell. And maybe it would have been without the benzos, but holy cow, um, it's a beast. And so one of the ways that I make sense of it when my body is just burning or I feel like I'm trying to give birth to the Hulk or I have a tremor or... Uh, you know, my mind is racing a million miles an hour um, is, and I know my hormones are somewhat at play here as I'm thinking, you know, again, if I had a healthy, robust nervous system that wasn't super sensitized, um, those hormones um, would probably be playing some havoc and wreaking some havoc on me. But right now they're hitting a tin can, right? So as that progesterone, it drops and that estrogen rises and all these things happen that can throw me off. Um, I don't have any cushion. I don't have anything to, um, the, the well's dry, right? There's no lubrication basically. And so everything's just hitting a dry, you know, decayed you know, surface. And it's, it's, it's making this huge racket in us. So this sensitized nervous system leaves us vulnerable to all sorts of, to feeling all sorts of feelings and to experiencing all kinds of sensations. 
um, in an exaggerated state. We're not making it up. It's really happening that way because our nervous system is so sensitized. The second thing she talks about is bewilderment, which again, I reviewed, and fear. And again, these are the three things that kind of keep us kind of trapped. Now, again, for us in benzo withdrawal, we our, our nervous systems are sensitized um, because we have a chemical injury. We have a medication injury. But I do think where this is relevant is that we can be doing everything in our power while we have that injury to not adding a whole lot of fear to that. So the bewilderment part is, oh my God, what is this? Oh my God, am I ever going to get better? Oh my God, it's back again. Um, you know, uh, you know, will I ever feel normal again? Will I ever be feel joyful again? All the things we say, right? That just the oh my gods and the what ifs and that bewilderment just digs into that groove even more, okay? And then the third thing she talks about is fear, the fear of the state we are in. It's terrifying to feel how we feel and it's terrifying to feel so alone in it. And we talked a lot about this in the last one. So again, um, sensitization, bewilderment, and fear are kind of the backdrop to what's going on. And then keep in mind what I also said the other day, which is that, you know, what provide what creates an anxious state in any human being are conditions of uncertainty, conditions of feeling out of control, and feeling and conditions of feeling vulnerable. Well, again, I want you to hold all six of these things in mind: sensitization, bewilderment, and fear. And then I want you to hold in mind that we are walking a path that, of course, creates feelings of being out of control, feeling uncertain, and feeling vulnerable. Okay, so we've got this, this, I don't like the word perfect storm, but for, for I can't think well tonight, so I'm going to use it, but that's kind of what we've got. We've got double trifectas of things going on, right? And so her approach is that once we understand what's happening, once we understand that we're in a sensitized state, we can begin to practice trying to not add fear to fear. So what I talked about yesterday was the concept of indecision, because again, she has this eight part trajectory that she watches, that she watched many, many, many hundreds and thousands of her clients go through from all over the world. And again, these weren't necessarily people that were injured at the time by tranquilizers, you know. Um, that was kind of what was out at that point. Valium and Librium were just getting onto the scene, and we hadn't hit a lot of the newer ones by the time she was writing. Xanax was just, you know, being talked about as Claire was, you know, kind of almost past her prime. So, um, but barbiturates and things like Librium and Valium, um, this wasn't the the group she was referring to. She was just referring to people that get sensitized for other reasons. But again, it's applicable to us. So this eight-part trajectory starts with indecision. We reviewed that yesterday. And so today we're going to talk about the second part. And so it moves down this path from indecision into what she calls suggestibility. Now, I think most of us, or most people at least that I've met in this process, can relate to this feeling of suggestibility. It goes hand in hand with being indecisive, right? When we feel like we can't make up our own minds, we can't come up with a, a good plan, when we're wondering should we taper faster, slower, liquid, dry cut, CT, detox, like what should we do? Uh, and we don't have doctors that are really guiding us in this and walking the path with us. You know, We're bringing the Ashton Manual to a lot of our doctors and many people I've talked to don't even tell their doctors they're tapering because they're afraid they're going to get cut off. So while you're so indecisive and kind of alone, it makes sense that your mind then moves into a state of suggestibility. And I know that I, I've lived here a lot, right, where I can't make up my mind about what I should do. So what do I do? I go on Benzo Buddies. I go on Beating Benzos. I go on Benzo Recovery. I go on Benzo Warriors. I go on all the sites, and I start looking to see what other people are doing. But the problem is, is, is that, again, like I've talked about in other videos, Going through benzo withdrawal is like a, it's like a, it's like a thumbprint, and meaning it's unique, and there is no formula for this. So as we go searching, uh, we're highly suggestible to well, this person did well with water taper, and this person said they did terrible with that, and this person used Aura Plus in their as a to create a um, a suspension, but this person said it's better to have a solution, and use you know. Um, 
you know, alcohol or do a water taper or this person said they did better in rehab or this person used NAD treatments or this person got stem cells. And oh my God, we can, we can lose ourselves in this, right? Because for every question we have, there's, you know, answers on both sides and good arguments on both sides. And we're highly suggestible, which of course, because there's answers on both sides and we're so suggestible, we get scared. We get more anxious and we try to figure out how are we going to handle this, which of course then feeds the indecision, right? So the suggestibility is a big one and I think it's timely. I wanted to get on today, even though it's late and 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 and, and put this one out. I'm doing this at 1030 at night um, because it's been a day of high suggestibility. I try to not surf the sites a lot because um, I tend to do that when I've got a question. And because I've been in a wave now for the last 10 days or so, of course, what do I start to do? I start to question everything. Did I screw up my taper? Am I doing my taper wrong? Should I be doing something different? What does everyone else say? Okay, and again, the more I get indecisive, the more suggestible I become. But we also become suggestible to ourselves as well. And and so, when we start having a lot of negative thoughts about ourselves, you know, that, you know, we start feeling bad about ourselves and about our situations, um, we're highly suggestible to the negative thoughts we have about ourselves and about our withdrawal process. And so, you know, one of the antidotes to anxiety or the, the antidote to anxiety is irrelevance. It's really adopting a mindset, changing your attitude towards your mind, towards your thoughts, towards your feelings, towards your perceptions and not giving it so much meaning, not making it define you. And I know I've been guilty of of withdrawal defines me and it defines me not because I'm weak, Um, it defines me because it's so overpowering and it's so scary. But again, in everything I talk about, I'm always talking about a practice and really working on trying to shift our attitudes and shift our mindsets. And so today was a perfect day to talk about suggestibility because I probably clocked four hours of looking things up online. Um, And at the end of the four hours, guess what? I didn't feel any better and I didn't have any answers. In fact, my head was spinning. It left me with more questions than answers. And and I I think that that's a a, a really... um, important thing for us to remember. These sites are wonderful. Uh, Again, our entire movement is based on peer support, so I don't knock these sites at all. That said, when we use them to get constant reassurance um, and or to constantly answer unanswerable questions, right? Like, what should I do? (laughs) Um, That's a great question. How should I taper? What should I do? Should I take another med? Should I change my diet? Should I take this supplement? Uh, And the answer to those questions is I don't know. And the reality is nobody else does really either. We can certainly look for patterns and we can take chances based on um, what other people have taught us. I mean, part of why I know to water taper wasn't because some doctor told me to do that. I learned that from you guys. I learned that from my peers. So I'm not saying there's not good information on there. If you can hear her snoring, sorry, the snoring's coming. Here it is. But I'm not saying there's not good information on there. I'm just saying remember that you're in a highly suggestible state. And more often than not, you're going to come off those rabbit holes with more questions than answers and probably feeling a little bit more anxious than relieved. Um, And so just remember that and know that it's a normal part of this. Um, People talk about all the time feeling like a little kid in this. You know, we we feel um, really insecure because we've become so indecisive, we've become so suggestible, and we've been used to being adults, most of us anyway, that weren't highly suggestible and weren't super indecisive. In fact, so many people that I've met in this are kind of high-functioning fixers, doers, problem solvers, and then we get ourselves backed into a corner with this stuff and we can't think our way out of it. We can't problem solve our way out of it. And so when we get indecisive or or we're suggestible, it's so foreign to us to feel that way that it it sends even worse thoughts our way about, oh my God, you know, what happened to me? And we'll get into that because that gets further along this trajectory that, that Claire Weeks talks about. So again, in the wrap up, 
The first phase she talks about is indecision. The second phase she talks about is suggestibility. Again, I think I can certainly relate to these and maybe you can. And the point in me telling you all these things is to normalize it and to humanize it and to know that you're not alone and that there's reasons why we're actually feeling what we're feeling. Um, Anyway, guys, take care.